Hey everyone, this video is about the Casio FX201P which was introduced in August 1976. And the 201P is a really notable calculator for collectors because it was the first Casio programmable calculator sold outside of Japan. And it demonstrates a lot of pioneering ideas that Casio evolved over the years through its series of advanced programmable calculators, many of which I have videos on. But it wasn't technically the first Casio programmable calculator. There was also the uh, Pro 101 from two years earlier in 1975, which appears to have only been sold in small numbers in Japan. And there are only a couple of known examples outside of Japan. And interestingly, Casio also did have a programmable desktop calculator, the AL1000, much earlier in 1967. This is a beautiful device with a Nixie tube display. And if anyone has one of these, please let me know in the comments. But the 201 was the first mass market Casio programmable, and it came on the market around the same time as the TI-58 and the HP-67. And it was the standard model out of a series of three devices. There was also the FX202P, kind of a deluxe version of the 201P. It had the same features, but had a separate silver oxide battery system uh, to store program memory for up to a year. And there was also the Pro FX1, which had a magnetic card system for storing and retrieving programs on credit card size magnetic cards. Physically, the 201P is very large and heavy by modern standards, or even compared to, say, the average Casio calculator from the 80s. Uh, it has a 14-digit VFD display that slopes slightly downwards, and it also includes two red LEDs that get displayed when the calculator expects data or displays a result. And the layout of the keyboard is fairly simple. Uh, the top row are keys related to programming. And the two rows below are the usual numeric functions and constants. The, uh, on the uh, numeric keypad, there's also these extra entry and answer keys, which I'll explain later. And although there's no shift key, there are labels written under many of the keys. These are actually the program command codes for that keys function. And you might also notice that despite being an algebraic calculator, there are no parentheses keys on the keyboard. On the back, we can access the battery compartment with its four double A's. And there's also a couple of rubber feet to stop the calculator slipping on a desk. Uh, there's also this mysterious screw down panel, which provides access to these contacts on the PCB. And I don't know what the function of this is. Uh, it's not mentioned in the user manual and I can't find any references online. So if you know or have any theories, please put them in the comments below. Here's a photo of the internals of the 202P from the Virtual Museum of Calculators. There's two Hitachi 4-bit microcontrollers. Presumably one was for normal operation and another for program editing and execution. There's also a Toshiba TC5006P, the first Japanese SRAM chip. And its capacity was one kilobit, so I presume this was used for the 127 program steps. The FX201P also had 14 data memory registers. And on the left of the board, you can see the Toshiba E6543 14-digit VFD. And as a scientific calculator, the 201P is interesting mostly because of what it doesn't do. Because in 1976, Casio had yet to implement operator precedence or parentheses. So in manual mode, even for the most basic calculations like 2 plus 3 times 4, we would need to think about how to input it. Because if we just entered that blindly, we'll get 20, which is probably not the answer we're expecting. And so without parentheses, there are a few options. The simplest, of course, is to reorder the terms and do the multiplication first. So 3 times 4 plus 2. And this works for the simple case, but most of the time we'd need to store intermediate results in memory registers. So for example, we could use the independent memory register. So 2 and 3 times 4, and then we can recall our sum. 
Or for more complex examples, we'd need to use the TIN data memory registers. We can access these through the entry and answer keys, uh, which in manual mode you can think of as store and recall. So let's enter our first term 2 into memory register 1. And we'll enter our second term into memory register 2. And then we can use the answer key to sum the two registers. And Casio didn't support operator precedence and parentheses until the FX39 and the 501P in 1978. So I was playing catch up at the time, especially with TI, who had support for these at least a few years earlier in its first programmable, the SR52. And the 201P does support constant operations, and these are a convenient way to perform the same operation repeatedly without the need to write a program. So say we wanted to convert some lengths from inches to centimetres by multiplying them by 2.54, or we can set our constant operation by hitting multiply twice in our expression. So let's convert 1 foot to centimetres, so 2.54 times times 12 equals now we can enter other amounts in inches and just hit equals to apply our conversion. Of course the 201P does include uh, the usual scientific operations. One thing to be aware of is that although the calculator operates to 10 digits of precision normally, it only uses 8 digits for trigonometric operations and logs. So we can see this if we do the sign of 45. And of course, if you use this value in a multiplication, uh, you will start to accumulate errors. So let's move on to programming now. And the 201P has a totally unique programming model that is different from any other calculator I've covered. Some people describe it as a simple Fortran. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it's a very simple register programming model that's best shown by example. And the 201P has two modes related to programming. There's a write mode which you use to create the program, and then there's uh, comp mode that you use to run it. So we'll start with my favourite full distance equation to calculate the distance an object falls under gravity in a time t. And I'll explain the program first and then we'll enter it to show how that works. And so this program takes a value in seconds as its input. And on the 201P, to do this we need to prompt for it using the entry statement with a memory number to store the value in. So in this case we store the time t in memory register 1. And so numbers in the 201P program always refer to our 10 memory registers unless you precede them with a K. And we can see this in the next statement. Uh, where we are multiplying the square of register 1 by 4.9 and then storing that into memory register 2. And then finally to output our result we use the answer statement along with the memory register to output. And so we'll go ahead now and actually enter this program to see how that works. So we'll start by switching to write mode and we'll hit um, enter or entry sorry to start recording the first statement and we can see that there's the instruction number one is displayed and the program code E2 and E2 is actually a reference to the entry key and it's might be hard to see but it's actually printed under the the key and so E is a reference to the row on the keyboard and 2 is a reference to the column and I'll go ahead now and type the rest of the program so one colon 2 equals k 4.9 times 1 times 1 colon and then answer to colon and to run the program we switch to comp mode and hit start and so we're prompted for an entry so let's enter 10 seconds and hit the entry key and so the object falls 490 meters 
And here's a much more complex e example program to solve the in Queen's chess puzzle. And I'll include a link in the video description to the source code. And this example shows most of the other features of 201P programming. So it uses numbered program labels, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it uses the special I register for indirect addressing and the IM statement. Uh, to retrieve and set the contents of the memory address being pointed to. And there are also if statements, so they take a Boolean condition and then two labels to jump to depending on whether the condition is true or false. In this particular case, the program is actually jumping to a non-existent program label 5 as a quick way to terminate the program. And in this particular version, uh, we set our size of our chessboard to 4, so k, k, k uh, 5, which is 4 plus 1. If you wanted to run it for n equals 8, you would change that code to k9. So I've gone ahead and entered the program, and so we can run it now. And the program takes about a minute to run, so we'll skip ahead. And so the program's finished now, and we can switch to run mode uh, to look at the memory locations 1 through 4 to see the results. So answer 1 is 3, answer 2 is 1, answer 3 is 4, and answer 4 is 2, which sounds right. And if you uh, set n to 8, the program takes 53 minutes and 47 seconds to complete, which could be the slowest of the calculators. I've run it on. And so the 201P was really an important device for Casio, being the start of their P family of mass market programmable calculators. And although in 1976 it was quite behind the offerings of HP and Texas Instruments, Casio did use it as a foundation for greatly improved models. They supported order of operations and moved to a keystroke programming model with the 502P and 602P. And then later in 1985 with the 4000P moved to full arithmetic expressions and the start of their familiar Casio basic programming language. And the 201P came with a program library book of example programs, which is a tradition that Casio continued with many of its future programmables. And so I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. And if you have, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to get alerted of new videos.